And welcome everybody to another Mark Bishop show. As you know, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. The old cliche, but it is like that with people too, because on this particular show, I, I have liquors all sorts. <laughs> Meaning that uh, professors to sex therapists to, oh God, you name it, every walk of life. But that's the idea of the show, because I like interesting people. and I like to hear their stories. And I like uh, for you to share what these stories are all about, like this lady. Her name is Angela Skirtu. You may have heard of her, actually. She's a speaker, an author, uh, couples and a sex therapist, mm -hmm. and a YouTuber and a podcaster as well, a member of the clan, so to speak. And uh, she is at uh, St. Louis Marriage Therapy, LLC. You can look her up from there. And uh, if you want to email her, you can do all of that too. So Angela Skirtu, which she was raised in St. Louis, Missouri. She got her bachelor's at the University of Hawaii and her master's at the University of Oregon. No, dimwit, huh? Which was the better university, Angela? And welcome. Oh, thank you so much. And oh, I loved them both for different reasons. In Hawaii, I used to do my homework on the beach. So I would take a little 20 minutes to do homework or study and then go swim and then come back and study for another 20 minutes and swim. So like University of Hawaii was really great for like the sunshine and being out on the beach. Um, I would say University of Oregon. I just loved the training I got there. It was a very, um, very impactful training that started my career. So it was, I would say it's, it really got me ignited for this field. So they're both mm -hmm. wonderful. Both wonderful in their own way, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The beach one appeals to me. <laughs> I mean, that's a great way to study. If you ever like, I don't yeah. study like others. Some, some, maybe you need to go surfing. <laughs> right. You've, uh, you've run a six figure business now for what? 13 years, right? Mm -hmm. You've been very successful. Uh, what's it about? Well, so I'm a couples and a sex therapist. And um, I mean, I do a lot of different things, but my main bread and butter is helping couples who are dealing with a bunch of different issues. My favorite case client actually is the best friends who uh, have friend zoned each other and they need just a little push in the bedroom to get back, you know, get busy again, basically. <laughs> uh, but so I work with couples. Uh, another way of putting it is like anything a couple fights about, that's what I have to be good at, <laughs> and which is a, a wide variety of topics, to be honest. Right. And then I also, like I said, I speak, I teach, there's, I write, there's a lot, I, there's a lot to running a business. <laughs> to be oh, tell me about it. And you're right? a solo, you're a solopreneur, right? I am a solopreneur, but I do have teams, right? So I, even, even solopreneurs do have to have people on their team to make it work. Like I, I really can't do it by myself. Yeah. It gets a bit too much all for one, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. I, and I, what I try to do is organize in such a way that I get to do the stuff I love right. and then I delegate or outsource or streamline the things that I don't love. <laughs> oh, that's smart. That's smart. It's almost sounding like that career you're in, you know, you've got to be a bit of a psychologist as well. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. marketing is a bit about psychology, right? Like you have to kind of understand how yeah. people think and what makes them like oh, want to come well, to you. <laughs> yeah. And, and often known as, you know, a taboo subject, so to speak, but that's, uh, I want to get into it and we will a little bit more. I just want to get a bit more about you for, for the viewers to understand who they're dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. You've written a couple of books. Tell us about those. All right. So the two books I've written, one is called Helping Couples Overcome Infidelity. It is a therapist manual, but it is written for both clinicians and or clients mm -hmm. and therapists. I write all of my books in very plain language because I want anybody to be able to read it and say, oh, I can take something from this. Right. Um, in that book, one of my favorite things I did in the chapters is I share a good story and a bad story. <laughs> like <laughs> this is what happens in like that magical, like they did it, they figured it out. They're, they're making their way through this issue. But then mm -hmm. I also share a story where it was a train wreck basically. And I just did the best that I could <laughs> with the couple at hand. I did that intentionally because for clinicians reading it, I wanted them to see that like th there's not all rainbows and butterflies when it comes to infidelity. Right. It is a wide range of outcomes. It's a very challenging topic to treat. And so I really wanted to bring that human element. And I found my clients like that too, because they're like, oh, okay, well, where are we on this spectrum of hope for this issue? So it's a very helpful way to look at it too. Right. right. And then the other book is Premarital Counseling, A Guide for Clinicians, which again right. is, is written for both. And it just covers milestones and helpful things for couples to talk about in that premarital time. But what's funny is I even use it for people who are post-married to just teach them. These are like communication skills that help. These are ways to 
keep the spark in the bedroom. These are things that help you to have an idea of what are the needs in a relationship that we need to be managing. Right, right. Yeah, the needs of a relationship. Okay, so premarital counseling and helping couples overcome infidelity. I gather uh, they'd be on Amazon, no doubt. Yes, you can find both on Amazon for sure. Now you are writing a third book. I I don't want to, you know, spill the milk, so to speak, but uh, uh, you are doing a third. It's coming out. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about it at all or just, uh, you know, I know you don't have a title for it yet, but. uh... Yeah, well, and so it's funny. Uh, All right. And this goes to like selling sex as a business, right? So my business is as a sex therapist and couples therapy, but part of what I'm selling is like this idea of how do we have a better sex life, right? And so even in figuring out this title for the book, I have to be thoughtful of the language that I use because um, I know we all hear that phrase sex sells, but actually it doesn't sell mainstream. It'll sell in that sort of underground sort of like, oh, if you go to like this little place or that little place on the internet, but like mainstream in a sort of way that you could just take that book off the shelf or read it on the airport while you're waiting for your flight. Right. It doesn't sell in that sort of mainstream. Well, why why is that, do you think? What what stops that? <laughs> well, I'm embarrassment, reading. Well, I'm, embarrassment in case somebody I'm, spots you reading it or, or what? I'm writing about just this topic. What, what the problem is, is that so the way I see sex is sex isn't complicated. It's actually our relationship with sex that's complicated. It's our country's relationship with sex that's complicated. All the things that you were taught growing up, all the beliefs that you were given or not given, all the shame that's been added to sex, that's what makes sex complicated. Actual sex is just people touching body parts and finding what feels good. Like at its basic level, that's all you're doing when you're having sex. But because we add all of these complications and relationship to it, then when somebody is sitting at the airport reading a sex book, they might be, what if somebody sees this? Is this okay? Should I be reading this? (laughs) You know, like, I've even thought of marketing, actually, like having these covers that are like playful title covers. So like a book cover that basically is like um, accounting 101, basically topics that nobody really cares that much about reading or wouldn't ask you a question about. Well, you never know. You (laughs) You never know. But so anyhow, I've been workshopping the title. And right now I'm thinking about like about sex or um, it's not a bomb. It's just sex because I'm really trying to like promote sex as a wholesome, normal, right. natural part of life. Like it isn't this big of a deal. Like I really want to neutralize it for people. And so as I'm workshopping that title, actually, if any of your viewers want to give me ideas of like, this would be a good title. I need something that is kind of more mainstream that won't right. scare the potential readers away, but also gets that little like, huh, right. I'm interested. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm looking forward to when you bring it out, but maybe we'll do an interview. I'll do another show called Nothing Like a Good Book. Yeah, and, uh, I, interview, I interview authors, and there's some mm-hmm. interesting. Well, they're not that well-known authors, which is good because mm-hmm. I'm helping them get up the ladder. You know what I mean? But uh, maybe that one, the third one there could be quite interesting. You know, Absolutely. Know. Well, and I'll be I'll be posting about it on YouTube when it's published. So of course people can which follow you, me you there. Do, you do have a YouTube channel, don't you? What is that now? What's so the just look up my name, Angela Skirtu, at YouTube, and you'll find my YouTube channel. And I just put different um relationship skills they can be from the sexual health perspective relationship help even have parenting skills on there because again doing couples therapy you have to be able to talk about anything a couple fights about (laughs) right right well yeah people come to you for advice that's the bottom line uh they're not coming to you look at a porn movie that's for sure you know yeah interesting and you just said all they got to do is look up angela's go to Mm -hmm. on the youtube channel and they find you i wish i wish mine was that easy um (laughs) my name mark bishop apparently there's quite a few of us out there mm-hmm. and on youtube and i had to run with uh people couldn't find me and then i had to run with 9360 a number at the end of it all mm-hmm. and then uh, my web guy just said to me look just just do forward slash mark uh, at mark bishop uh, mm-hmm. media, business uh podcasts and apparently that's working now people are going straight to it which is good so that's good. That's that now that's why I love the weird name, for example. You know, well, yeah, it's like I mean, strange. how many spirituals are out there? Not many. <laughs> On any given day, you're seeing clients, you're getting interviewed for podcasts and articles, mm-hmm. you're writing a book, speaking at local or national uh, business conferences and so on. But on top of it all, you're still a mom and a wife and a friend. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the obvious question, how on earth do you handle it all? I, this is obviously a great question. A theme. <laughs> no, no, this is an important question for all business owners and entrepreneurs, because I think that it is foundational for business owners to have a good self-care and work-life balance in mm -hmm. some way, shape or form, which includes eating healthy, exercise, taking breaks, like actually stopping for lunch, perhaps mm -hmm. for an hour, getting mm -hmm. your brain off of doing constantly. Yeah, that's um, a very good idea. It, well, we need it. We need breaks and you need downtime, right? So like how I do it is um, the work that I do has to have a good work-life balance. So I have, I have an end at a certain time in the evening. And um, actually, I just spent all weekend training um, for something called a sexual attitude readjustment where you challenge people's values. So if a weekend like that occurs mm -hmm. where I've worked all weekend, then I offer time during the week to take time off. So like I take actual time off. Right. I try to keep my hourly hourly caseload of everything, not mm -hmm. just clients, every bit, every little project right. <laughs> to around 40 hours or less. And there are set times in the evenings where I really am a wife and a mom and I just hang out and and I even have my own hobbies. Like that's the other thing. I, I, I love working with entrepreneurs because they're, they're they have so many big ideas and they want to do this, this and this. And I always love to ask the question, and what do you do for fun? Yeah. And they, they're like, well, I work for fun. I'm like, no, no, no. That's work, and it is great that you're passionate about your work. For anyone who's listening, who's a cool entrepreneur, I love that you're passionate about your work, and you need to have something else that's very different than what you do, like yeah. roller skating or Legos or I don't know, painting of some sort. You need other things. You got to. So I just make sure that I have hobbies. Stretch the mind. So you help with uh, desire discrepancy and fidelity. Uh, co-parenting issues, finance issues, wanting to have better sex. I mean, at the end of the day, a couple would come to you with issues and problems based on their sexual uh, life, if you like, together, mm -hmm. either him or her. I'm interested to understand, are there specific age groups more than ever? Is it five years after marriage it goes out the door? Is it seeing other women, you know, is it uh, the woman or is it the man? I mean, how does it all come together? That's a big question. With like, your experience <laughs> of 14 years. Come well, on. I can tell you there, there are certain age time frames and life cycle time frames that people come in. Right. So, for example, one common time for sexual problems is right after the second baby. Um, really? They have, yes, yes. So, like, they have their, they have a, good sex life until after the first baby uh -huh. and then um then they struggle with their sex life at that point but hmm. they know they're going to try and have sex for another baby and so there's a little bit of like having sex for procreation that they do that makes them feel safe or like it's not a big deal it's just baby stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they have the second child and that about a year later is when their sex life tanks and that's when they, it's usually a year or two after second baby that I'll start seeing people come in and say, hey, we're not really having sex much. We're struggling. You got to think about that time frame, right? Young children, mm -hmm. they are overwhelmed. There's a lot going mm -hmm. on. And they probably, you know, so this is something I've been talking to a lot of my people about is who's in your child care team. So a lot of people are trying to do it by themselves, just the mom and the dad or whatever parents, even if they're not male, it could be female, female, male, male, you know, whoever, whoever you are, yeah, however you were that. designed. Um, but so if there's only two of you and you don't have a childcare team beyond, beyond the two of you, then that's part of the reason that prevents them from being sexual is they don't have like someone mm. they can rely on for dates or someone they can rely on for like, you know, I mentioned having a hobby. How does one have a hobby if they don't have childcare or time right. to be an adult. And right, well, I can, I can see the mother with two, uh, a baby, the second baby, yeah. and the other little one pulling on the leg uh, yep. between between all day as a domestic engineer trying to run that company with headaches and God knows what else. And then, you know, so Harvey's busy, tired too. But at the end of the day, his testosterone is up or whatever, and there's problems, right? Yep. I, no, I, I've got a headache. Or no, I don't feel like mm -hmm. it or this or that or... Yep. It's such a psychological thing. There must be thousands of couples 
There Literally are. Literally hundreds of thousands of couples. There are, and these days both parties are working now. It's it's very yeah. it's more rare for one person to work and one person to stay home. Like they're both working full time jobs and then doing full time parenting right. and trying to figure this out. And right. some of them are doing it in isolation, and that is that can be the problem. Some of them have help, but they struggle to seek the help because there's also a mommy guilt that many women struggle with. I it's funny I don't hear the term daddy guilt. But I think that it can go both ways. Angela, (laughs) if you'd be so kind, just explain that to me. A mommy guilt? Yes, mommy guilt is when a woman feels like she needs to be responsible for everything. Like all of the emotional, physical, um, psychological needs of a child to the point that she um, neglects her own needs and desires. And hmm. so like she can't even like, even if she has child care, say she does have a child care team, she won't take it because she feels guilty that she's not the one giving the needs to the child. And so like they won't go on dates or they struggle to take that leap away from the child right. and take couples time because they feel they feel like and like I said, it's not just mommies. I see daddies doing this, too. Like couples can do it as a team. It can just be one partner. But it's right. this feeling of I need to be everything, the be all for this child. And I'm if I'm not, I am doing something wrong. And right. I, I think it's just a weird cultural shift that has taken place mm-hmm. that needs a little more balance. Like, yes, you can be there for your child and you can have a personal relationship with your partner and you can be your own person. But we in, in American society, I think it's a real struggle. Like if people basically have working kids and that's their only focus. Yeah. Which to answer that question, there's a second group that really struggles. And it's the ones who just put their nose to the grindstone and raised the children and just made it all about the kids. And then suddenly the kids get independent. I mean, they don't need you forever. Right. You know, the hope is that you're making yourself obsolete as a parent at some point. Right. Mm-hmm. And so right. as the children become independent and go launch, that's the other time that's most common. And so I get mm-hmm. older couples who are like, had different plans for what happens when the kids are leaving and we have our independent time. Like right. one partner might be like ready to have sex and be back at teenagers. And the other partner might be like, I, hmm, I've i lost touch with you. I don't even know if I want that in my life. Right. And again, that could be any gender too. Like I've noticed that it really, it really varies, but that's that's the other time where people tend to come in for sexual problems. It, uh, it sounds like to me that uh, I, I think, um, you know, the old uh, date night, okay, is a very important thing if it's kept up. Uh, uh, that yeah. couples should work at, perhaps. Mm-hmm. I would say so. I mean, I think it's very important to have the date night. I think, so this is this is my unpopular opinion that's probably going to make some waves. Well, you're not losing, my point is you're not losing sight of each other. You're not growing apart. You're still socializing you're still getting out you're still getting made up or yeah. dressed up and respect for each other to want mm-hmm. to look nice for each other to go out somewhere just yeah. like we did before and just after we got married do you know what i mean i do well so the, the opinion i wanted to share is like divorced couples you know couples who are co-parenting if mm-hmm. you look at their custody schedules they actually have custody schedules that are set up in a way that they can have couples time with their new partners family time with their kids right. and even some time for themselves and so it it's unpopular but the reality is i think that the divorce custody schedules are a great like like visual for how if you stay married what could you do to like create a space where you get couples time family time and individual time and you'll hear this like people who are remarried they'll say oh i love this part because we get like weekends that are just devoted to us like their new partners but right. the reality is they needed that in the original marriage right. to make it work and they don't do it. And so, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that is how people are ending up getting it is in their second marriage. Angela, we've run 19 minutes and I haven't even brought sex up yet. To the degree. And I'm <laughs> well, speaking I mean, I've been talking about it. Love the degree. <laughs> kinky sex, kinky sex. I've got to understand. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> uh, does that cause some fights or what? Um, do people come to you wanting that? Yeah, of course. Everybody wants to spice up their love life. And not everybody knows what they mean by kinky sex. Kink literally just means different from a typical American sex. So a typical American sex is you kiss a little, you touch a little, you do oral sex, and then PNV intercourse, which is penis and vagina, if that's okay to say. 
Um, and it's actually a very boring sex. Like you can do it that way, but it's only one of multiple ways of being sexual. And so a lot of people are coming to me to spice up or kink up their sex life and just see what, is, <laughs> what else is out there. Um, do you and, give them a book of Kama Sutra? <laughs> see, Kama Sutra is still doing the same thing. You're still right. just ending right. with that PNV intercourse. It's just different positions. Like everybody, right, when they right. think of kinking, they're like different position. I'm like, did you know your whole body is sexual? Like, what are you doing to ignite all of your senses? What yeah. are you doing to make this a full body experience? Yeah. Um, what if uh, somebody doesn't have an erection or someone um, doesn't have access to pleasure down there? Are there other ways that you can find to be intimate and sexual that don't have to include those parts if they're not working for the day or for a period of time? Because people, sexual problems are actually a part of life. Oh, like they are. they're yeah, a natural they're part of life, right? At times people well, deal with erectile dysfunction. Let's face it, how many divorce because uh, the closeness is gone, that that want for each other, although it could be down there, they don't know how to express it. Yeah. And, and, it and apart, you know, you go into sex therapy. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what, um, I just, I'm trying to get into your head and the job you do to sit there and say, okay, guys, what's wrong? Who's doing what? Do you ever recommend sex toys to them to go shopping oh, yeah. or anything? You do? Yeah. If, if yeah. it's real, I actually have a 70s style briefcase under the desk right now with all of my <laughs> playful sex toys. Cause <laughs> I like it. I got it from a garage sale. My uncle, he's like, would you need a briefcase? And I'm like, absolutely. Right, right. So people, right. they see it. They don't know what it is. And then I bring it out and I'm like, all right, let's talk about some sex. Oh, life. movies. Do you, do you ever recommend movies to them yeah. to watch together first or anything? Yes, X, I, have, I have. I have. X rated I, or whatever. I will recommend them. But first I have worksheets I've created that help people to watch sexual content from a neutral and curious space because right. if you just send people things to watch what they'll do is they'll watch it from that critical mind and they'll be like oh that's gross why would you do this i don't want that you know so uh. first i have to yeah first i have to prime them and neutralize because again this goes back to what i said before it's right it's, sex is not complicated it's your relationship with sex that's complicated of course, of course. that's the issue isn't it yeah it's, and uh... so i have to like train them to neutralize and like open-mindedly watch those things and even with that like that doesn't mean you have to try everything you see it just means be open to considering it and talking right. about it first Right. And then I will recommend different shows. There's even great Netflix shows right now. People can watch like How to Build a Sex Room and Sex, Love and Goop or Principles and Pleasure. Those are all on Netflix. So they're at least in the enough of a range that you could just watch them right. on Friday night. Like they don't yeah. even have to do a subscription anywhere unless they don't have Netflix. <laughs> I don't know. I think everybody Netflix is in shows to some degree, right? <laughs> do, do, any, do any of them ever confess that they they try swingers clubs or? Oh, yeah. That is actually one of the things that I do is if people are interested in exploring ethical non-monogamy, I at least try to give them some best practices for how to do that in a way that is safe for them and that like is exploring it. Because the thing is, is what typically happens is people just jump right into the deep end of the pool and then they come to me because they feel like they've gotten burned in that experience. Mm. And I'm really a fan of like dipping your toes in the water, like take a small experience, <laughs> try it out, get to know people who are swingers, for example, and like talk to them about what they did to get into this space. And then like over time get there. But most people, you know, like not everybody comes to me before. Usually they like, we have a unique culture in that we don't like to get help until everything's broken. Television's so, done. Yeah. so when they yeah. do come to me before, I can absolutely teach people how to do that in a respectful and even fun way. But if it's the opposite way, I can still help. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> what on earth got you into this industry? A lot of things. Um, one of the things is, uh, I mean, it's religious trauma. I was raised in a pretty conservative religious background that really shamed sex. And as a result, a lot of the women around me were getting married very early. And yeah. then a year later, they'd all call me because I was still the person everybody would talk to. And they'd say, I'm not enjoying sex anymore. I'm just doing this for him. And I was like, well, there's a problem because we were basically taught that if you wait until marriage, then once you're married, go have fun. It's fine. But right. once you've Train somebody to believe that sex is bad, sex is evil, sex is wrong. You don't just like switch that over after you're married and like, I'm fine. Unless you're like a rebellious spirit and you like didn't listen the whole time, it's going to consciously shut down your natural desire. And so that's what really actually got me into this field. 
that. And I used to watch this really funny lady, Sue Johansson, who would like play with sex toys on the TV and show everybody and she'd rate them and she'd be like, take questions. And I said, I could do that. That sounds amazing. And I can't wait to do that. Right. And so right. those two kind of formative stories really got I'm me. Into this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what is you, what do you folks think of you, you know, you're doing this? Oh, my father and mother, my mother loves it. She thinks it's hilarious. Um, right. My dad is a preacher, so he accepts that I do it, but I would not say he approves. And he well, loves me, though. So, like, you know, it's one of those, uh, I, don't I don't know why you do this, but I accept that this is how you've chosen to live your life. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's a tough one, isn't it? You start talking about religion and God wants you to be happy and fulfilled mm -hmm. of the beautiful bodies he gave us. Yeah. What kind of clients um, do you mainly get, would you say? Um, it's a mix. So I would say I have really marketed to those best friends who just want that push. So I get a lot of best friends who are just trying to reignite their sex life. I do get a lot of infidelity clients since I did write the book and I am I would be considered an expert, expert in the infidelity field. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's all across the gamut, you know, like I have people who want to try different kinks or who want to become ethically non-monogamous. I have people who are just there because they're struggling with parenting and how that impacts their intimacy. Right. Because of course, right. if you're fighting about your kids right before you're trying to have sex, like that impacts things. Right. So I always say that uh, sex therapy is life therapy. You really have to like improve the whole quality of life to improve a sex life. Um, but really it's just, it's, uh, it, it, it's so interesting how many different kinds of clients end up seeing me because when you start working on sex, what you end up doing is developing skills for other parts of your life. It's the most vulnerable mm. topic, right? So when right. you learn to negotiate yeah. for your needs when it comes to sex or when you learn to own your sexuality and your sense of who you are as a sexual person, that impacts who you are as a person day to day and how you interact in this world. Okay. Now, what about those that come to you that, <clears throat> uh, how do I phrase this? Maybe have been pushing down inside them how they really want to feel and express themselves as people, i.e., uh, lesbian, i.e., homosexual, uh, i.e., uh, bi. Yeah. Um, you know, that surely that's tough. Especially by men. <laughs> that one's the one that's become more uh, common that uh, challenge is like when a man is coming to terms with his own bisexuality and right. it's just not a very accepted, like, so it's, it is at least accept, accepted and sexualized for a female mm -hmm. to be a bisexual. Cause they're like, ah, who wouldn't want to see a woman kissing another woman? So, right. Like there's a way we sexualize and. Mm -hmm. um, there's more and more of it. I noticed coming up on television now. Yeah. In shows and in, even in mm -hmm. ads, even in ads, you know, Couples yeah. aren't the the traditional and the and the, mm -hmm. you know, the male female everything's perfect and the world's lovely. Uh, yeah. It's more real now of mm -hmm. girlfriends and boyfriends and so on. But I I just wonder, you know, when you're in a sanctum sitting there and if the guy bursts out and finally says it, what are the reactions of the women? It's, How do they take it? Do most of them scurry or or do a higher percentage say, you know, sorry, darling, I didn't realize. You know what? Well, the reality is that is how it happens, right? That nobody, like people come to terms with who they are as sexual people sometimes later in life. It would be nice if we could do it early on so we could have like a conversation with our partner about, hey, this is who I am and this is what I've right. learned about myself. Right. But because our relationship with sex is not a, a, a wholesome and healthy one, then people are, are needing to hide parts of themselves for longer periods of time. But something yes. happens when you hit your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. I've seen it like uh, again and again, people want to be themselves. They want to feel that authenticity. And so there's a, there's a part of that that's like finding your sexual self and really owning who you are. And so it tends to happen as people get older. And of course, they're already coupled, right? And so there's yeah. a wide range of responses. It depends on each person's emotion regulation skills, like their ability to manage themselves and take care of themselves. It depends on their openness to open mindedness to different ways of sexual being. Um, but I've seen all kinds of responses. I've had people who've been very compassionate and tried to figure out what to do with each other. I've had people who are like, this can't happen. We're going to divorce. 
Um, and in situations like that, people have to figure out if they are going to repress that or if they're going to accept that this is a part of the situation, but nothing's going to happen with it. And right. I mean, right. my job is to help people figure that stuff out. And I won't say there are always easy answers, right? Well, you always I, care about people. You know, you, you've got to love yeah. people and, and you've got to have a kind heart to do this work, I think, because nobody's bad. They're all God's children. And uh, I just think this way or I think that way or this bothers me or I need to get this off my chest or, you know, whether it's kinky toys or something you should try together. or uh, What 51%, I think it is, divorces now in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's usually around that 50% mark. I don't know the specific it's number. High, it, can, it? It, can, it? it can teeter <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I just, you know, the breakdown, number one, I, I, I know that people marry too young, miles too young. They haven't even lived, haven't sowed any wild oats, haven't seen the world, done nothing. Think they were so madly in love, but mm -hmm. if they could just hang on, you know, hang on. I didn't marry personally until I was 47. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, career took a lot of that away because I was a rolling stone, in, you know, in, in the media for many years. And it's very difficult to, to settle. But uh, I was brought up, you know, one marriage, one life, till death to us part, no matter what. And uh, that's old fashioned now, I know. But, uh, and people are living together, not getting married. Yeah. But then you get into babies, you get into all different issues again, and all that jazz. How do you sell, uh, I was going to say, how do you sell sex um, <laughs> in another way? <laughs> well, uh, by right, walking a very tight rope, really. So I'm on YouTube, I'm on Google, but those, those mediums are very strongly censoring things that are related to sex. And so I have to be very thoughtful about the content that I put out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also am trying to be my authentic self too, right? So I don't consider myself like that X rated or even that R rated of a therapist. I, I actually work, I'm in my local business chamber of commerce, right? So like I have right. to talk to people on yeah. a regular basis about sex. Oh, I'm Angela, you know, she's the sex bird. <laughs> oh, they love it. They're like, yeah, we have one in the group. It's fun, you know, but like I have learned how to PG it up, so to speak, and make sure right. that the way that I'm talking is thoughtful of the people around me. But for some people, even the mention of sex is like, oh my gosh, what's she doing here? <laughs> you know? And so, uh, I mean, that so actually in certain groups, so I've been in the Bible Belt for a really long time. It's the St. Louis, right? And so even my my website title is Therapist in St. Louis, which is very generic. And I was intentional about that. St. Louis marriage therapy. I, I didn't say St. Louis sex therapy. I don't have a website that's a sex therapy site because I right. wanted people to be like, it's okay. She's a therapist. She's a therapist. Right. You know, right. like you, you've got to like calm the nerves of the people so they know like, Look, I just talked to you. And that's the other thing. It's like, it's talk therapy. Yeah, yeah, talking but the, to yeah. people. Well, this is it. But a lot of moms and dads and people don't realize, you know, how many women go to these celebration nights, whatever it's for, you know, where there's mm -hmm. male strippers, right? And it's yeah. all women. Or they or they go to these shows that are filthy comedians or whatever, you know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but, but women have an outlet. Mm -hmm. And women can do their things if they want to, you know what I mean? And uh, But the one that worries me is infidelity. Right now, you must get enough of these, right? Because infidelity is very difficult from a male perspective. You, you look, but don't touch, like a menu, you know. Well, I mean, you can't help it, it's everywhere. You understand? Well, and that's so. I have a whole video series about micro cheating, and what micro cheating is is basically it's monogamous couples who haven't had real honest conversations about where the lines are for crossing in oh, their okay. relationships. Right. So, there are due to social media there are a wide range of ways to cheat on your partner now just a whole menu of them yeah. and not everybody agrees with what those lines are right so it, what i do with people who are kind of in that middle ground where it's like somebody kind of crossed a line but they didn't even know it was a line here's an example so on facebook is it okay to like somebody's post well i mean it should be or shouldn't it be it depends on your values and if it's the person of the opposite sex, is there a certain number of likes that like that start to bring a red flag for me? Or is it no, just whatever, it's Facebook. Facebook is Facebook, it's not a big deal. Like when does it cross the line? Or for example, even in compliments, so these are the conversations I'll break down with couples just to get them being clear with each other about what their boundaries are. My yeah. job isn't to tell you this is what is cheating and what is not other than cheating to me, the definition is 
going outside of whatever your agreed upon boundaries are in the relationship. So, so, the, so let's get this straight. The very first thing you're talking about is you set the boundaries. Yeah, but people That's aren't setting the boundaries. You've got to have a discussion to set the boundaries. You right? have to have an overt discussion about here's overt what I discussion. think are the boundaries that are crossing out of our relationship agreement because right. like i said some person might like someone's facebook post and be like whatever that's not a big deal a very different person will say no you keep liking this one person's post and that's this you know maybe your ex-girlfriend or something right like right. when does it become disrespectful when does it feel like it's crossing the line of our relationship agreement and couples need to have very direct conversations you talk about, happen, okay you oh. talk about facebook i hate the thing you know <laughs> the worst thing that ever happened in the world was social media i'm telling you now it's okay. called conversations couples uh divorces god knows what children in trouble oh here's the deal mm -hmm. getting meeting somebody and having lunch business lunch yeah drink after five o'clock you ride at least two other things next minute you're in their bed now that to me is infidelity but then again hey if i had the conversation early with the cheese and kisses mm -hmm. right the missus the boundaries were you can do what you want to do but don't bring it home yeah and see i wouldn't agree with you on all of those boundaries for myself right so like uh me and my partner have to network well, as would, part of I'm our jobs saying, you know, all the yeah. time right like i I just did networking this morning with a guy. It was breakfast, but like I, I don't think networking and having a conversation about a business would be in the cheating category. No, no, um, no, no, no. I didn't say having that was cheating. I'm saying if it went further, infidelity is, is uh, you know, if you're married to somebody, you're married to them, mm -hmm. right? You're supposed to love them and they love you. And they. the biggest thing is trust. To me, it's trust. Well, I understand what you're saying, but like this is how far I go with it, right? So like even networking, for example, some people would say, I'm fine with you networking in the morning or at lunch when I know that it's a daytime activity, but doing drinks alone with somebody after work feels like crossing a line for me. Okay. And so, or, but they may feel different about it being in a group situation. Like if you're going to a group, because there's those after hours networking that are group things, that feels okay. Cause that's everybody going there. But if you're alone drinking with somebody, what are you doing drinking? And again, I'm not telling you whether these are right or wrong. I'm telling no. you the conversations that happen in my office. Yes. And all yes. I care about yes. is helping them get on the same page so mm -hmm. that they're not unintentionally hurting each other. Because what's right. crazy is a lot of times it's unintentional. It's like, I didn't even know that would have made you feel that right. way. <laughs> Communication. <laughs> it's yeah. marvelous, isn't it? Communication. Unbelievable. So uh, why do you think people cheat? The number other, one other reason you get tired of each other. <laughs> I mean, actually, the number one reason is opportunity. It just was, opportunity. Yeah, opportunity. The research <laughs> suggests that just uh, the opportunity presented itself, and you didn't think you'd get caught. I mean, it's uh, not good uh, reasons. It's like, weak, there's no friend. noble reason to cheat. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> like their paths cross. They start usually they start talking as friends, and then it gets a little flirty. And then one thing leads to another, but it's typically, it's two, it's a, a husband of one and a wife of another who are both going through just a rough patch, which everybody goes through rough patches, but then of their course. paths cross. They have to work through them together. Yeah. And instead of them talking to their partners about how they're struggling, they kind of find solace first with another person and the friendship gets deeper and then they cross little boundaries and get a little flirty. And then before you know it, they cross, 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 and then, then they're cheating. And right. what you'll what you'll find is so interesting. I asked them, like, did you think along the way? There's a way their brain almost like shuts off a little bit. Like they they just do it. They don't even think about it. So then when you ask later, why did you do this? They'll be kind of confused. Like, I don't, I, mean, know. I don't know why. I just I knew it was like I know it's I should for that. Yeah. yeah, it's it's because there's an alert. Like I always say this, but so That's it's shameful. Right. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. But there's underneath shame and, and like, oh, you're not supposed to. There's a deep intoxication. And there's a little excitement to that taboo. And so right. I think that fuels the fire right. and draws people into crossing those boundaries quicker. Right. And really, you know, of course, what we all needed to do was just talk to our spouses originally about, you know, hey, I recognize that I'm feeling drawn to this other person and I don't want to do anything, but I, I'm feeling this in me. Like wow. I'm recognizing that I'm. I'm feeling un, uh, unfulfilled in our relationship. Can we talk about this? And that's actually the kind of conversations I get them talking about for prevention, because you right. can prevent infidelity if, yeah. 
Okay. People are having honest conversations when they're feeling that draw away. And what about um, after the event? You know, after an affair? Guilt. guilt. What about after an event? He comes home and I've got to tell you something. Uh, you know, <laughs> how many of those do you get? <laughs> it, it all depends. And not everyone feels guilty. Like some people feel guilty. Some people feel it depends Sometimes. on the kind of affair it is. If it was an exit affair, which is when people are kind of already grieving the loss of their relationship, but they start cheating before they actually divorce or end it. They right. don't feel any guilt. They feel kind of entitled to doing it. Uh, okay. Move to another slate because it's very hurtful. It's painful. Yeah, um, and they, they, in those situations, they may feel like they did try to talk to their partner and their partner never listened or did anything about it. And so there's a way they've already grieved the loss, kind of like cancer. When people have a partner who's dying of cancer, there's a way people grieve along the way, yeah. not just afterwards. There's a way people grieve the death of their relationships as they're going through it. Right, right, right. And I mean, it must be one of the ones would be very hurtful if you've got a girlfriend, a close friend, girlfriend, who's mm -hmm. perhaps playing up with your husband or Vicky Verka, you know, I guess that adds to the pain even more. But, but do you think it's possible to have a healthy, happy marriage? Oh, yeah, of course. I I mean, I'm getting married and I, I've had a really healthy, happy relationship with my partner and I've seen other people who've had healthy, happy relationships. Mm -hmm. I do think it takes a level of work. I think there are certain personality styles that definitely work better with each other than others. Oh, right. So it's not, it's not just like people always talk about like the work of marriage, right? But like there are some relationships that are way harder work than others. And that's yeah, why some people end up getting divorced yeah. Yeah. because when they then get into that second relationship and realize, oh, this is way easier work. Like there is work and effort, but it shouldn't be so heavy that you feel like you're sacrificing your own health and well being to stay in the marriage. And right. that's where, like, that work right. is probably not good for you, right. you know? It's almost like you, you wish you could, you know, have a magic ball or something that could tell you, no, not a good, not a good. The closest thing to it that we have, if you're into astrology at all, is uh, relationship uh, blending that you've, yeah. even, that you've even got a chance with. You know, you can take that with a grain of salt. But married people can have good sex, right? Or should they just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can definitely have good sex, but they With do. Your wife. <laughs> well, <laughs> good, good point, Mark. And yes, they can have good sex. Yes, they can have good sex with their wives. But one thing that does have to happen. So everybody typically has a honeymoon period in the first one to two years of a relationship. There comes a point after that honeymoon period where they actually have to put intentional effort into their sex life. Couples who know that that's part of keeping their sex life strong, then keep up a healthy sex life. And part of that work is just communication, being direct and open and being willing to sexually evolve with each other. Right. Those are the couples who have a good sex life. And I do know couples who've had, who've been together 20 years and are still just madly and erotically in love with each other. But the couples who go through that honeymoon period and then start to lose their desire, but don't put any effort in at that point, will just have a slow trickle away until they hit dead bedrooms and like i said it usually happens after second kid and either yeah. they'll come and get my help or someone like me's help or they'll just put their nose to the grindstone and keep doing kids stuff for the next few years until it resurfaces after the yeah. kids go away because that's one of the things they'll do to justify it they'll say you know what this is just the time that's about our kids so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna worry about this i'm gonna compartmentalize my sex life or my lack of sex life and just focus right. on this for now Right. But then once those kids are gone, you can't compartmentalize it anymore because they were still thinking, okay, but they're gone now. So what about us? Can we mm -hmm. do us? Mm -hmm. Well, it's too late, my love. I've got this bimbo around the... <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens too. Oh, I will always yeah, have a yeah, job. <laughs> so, so in closing, what's it take to keep a strong sex life in a long-term relationship? In a nutshell. What are your recommendations, boss? A couple things. Good communication, clear, direct communication, mm -hmm. a willingness to evolve sexually mm -hmm. throughout your life, mm -hmm. and a neutral relationship a with willingness sex. Willingness to evolve. And evolve. Uh, discussion. And open yeah, with each other. evolve. Be open to new things, trying different things, exploring different discuss, sensations discussing in the body. Sex. Discussing sex. Yeah. Right? Very clear communication about sex. Days. Talking about sex, talking about your interests, desires, things you like, things you don't like, things you right. like to try, 
uh, unique ideas to fantasies. Yes, you have to have clear, direct communication about sex in sexual experiences and out of sexual experiences. Sex being right. a casual conversation. So that it's yeah. not like, oh my gosh, the sex is a bomb. It's like, yeah, I was thinking about this sexual thing. Oh, interesting. Well, I've never thought of that. What do you think about it? That casual of a conversation. <laughs> Serious. Women are better like talkers than men, and women can relate. They share. They can sit down at a table with a nice glass of wine and relate and talk about things. Um, a lot, a lot of guys are eggheads. You know what I mean? They just. I mean, I know some pretty emotionally intelligent men. They don't, they don't talk. <laughs> they don't open up. They, they hold it all inside. You know, massive yeah, Virgos. I, I <laughs> no, know but, quite yeah. a few emotionally intelligent men who can talk and can even well, talk good. better than me about some sexual topics. So I think it there just depends go. on how you educate yourself. But they also need to evolve, and you need a neutral relationship around sex. So that means not negative or positive. <laughs> just a curious open-mindedness to see what's out there explore different sensations right. like not that sort of oh sex is bad or evil or dirty like no sex is sex it's a natural part of life it's okay yeah. like it literally created you and me do you, like do you ever have conversations for instance with the couples where he might say or she might say you know no well it'd be him first i would imagine you know this is absolute goal you know on on uh, on the tv in a, in a series or something or other and mm -hmm. you know uh, high heels and 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 suspenders and you know really spunky and he maybe he'd like to say oh my god look at that wouldn't you love to get that right now the woman can say what a hunk oh you know the big guy comes up with muscles and this and that is that therapy in being open Yes, absolutely. I think all of my therapy is teaching people to be open minded and to go back to like where boundaries are. Some couples, it is okay to just talk openly about who I think that man or that woman or that person is hot. Like some couples, it doesn't hold them back or they don't take right. it personally because somebody finds someone else attractive. There are attractive people all over the world. Like That's it, it. to think that you will never be attracted to other person is an unreasonable expectation. Oh, yeah, hopeless, hopeless. That's what I silly. Started. That's why I said, you know, you're a look, but don't touch. You know, that's, that's the old adage with once you're married sort of thing. It's, you know, no matter Some how. Some couples much. look and don't necessarily touch, but do compliment together. Some couples look and touch if that's the boundaries they're setting. Because, again, I work with ethically non-monogamous folks, too. Yeah. So there are couples who have ways to touch. <laughs> I, think, I think there's something in this business where you're going to have 10 wives. You know what I mean? I mean... <laughs> As long as each of those wives is consenting and open to that relationship style, you can do whatever you want. Uh, yeah, right, <laughs> and if they're yeah. not, then you can't. <laughs> or you have to find somebody who is open to that. <laughs> Angela Skirtu, that's S-K-U-R-T-U, -U, yeah. at gmail.com. Is, is that, no, that's your, they can get you there too. But here's the thing I really want to give you folks, the therapist, com, right? HTTPS and so on, dub, dub, dub therapist uh, in St. Louis. So it would be St. Louis. <laughs> All right. Well, I was taught St. Louis. It's very hard. <laughs> you have them. I'm, I mean, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, mm -hmm. right? Uh, all over, really, but Melbourne. You have a Melbourne, don't you, in America? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, potato, you know. <laughs> I try to listen to people at people's accents. So I'll say Melbourne. That's what well, I heard one yesterday, to. which surprised me because I always thought it was, uh, uh, come on. Uh, I should know it. It got flooded. You know, the famous jazz plays, uh, New Orleans. I used to say <laughs> New Orleans, right? Mm -hmm. New Orleans. And someone said, no, 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 no. It's New Orleans. No. Oh, okay. And yet I'm watching a news report the other night and here's this dude of a dignitary of all people says New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, okay. So it's not New Orleans. <laughs> I mean, it's a, everybody can do whatever they want, right? <laughs> whatever you want, whatever it is. Go and have <laughs> the lady that opens the bedroom doors. Yes. <laughs> That's who she is, Angela. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I've learned a lot from you today. Thank you and, for having uh, me. It's uh, People can contact you how. Share that. Well, the real place I want people to find me is on YouTube. So if you can connect to YouTube, it's Angela Skirtu. Just look Angela Skirtu up on YouTube. And you did mention the email. So people can email me. They can submit a contact form at therapistinstlouis.com. 
My ask is that you like and subscribe on YouTube and submit your comments. I do respond to them and I learn from y'all too. So if there's anything people are like, I want to learn more about this, send me a comment. I'll, maybe I'll make a video about it. Right, right. Now that's good. You can learn from uh, yeah. followers, right? I and, learn from uh, them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, same for me. Ditto, folks. Uh, appreciate any support, you know. I do the like thing and everything else you've got to do. And by all means, uh, I do say you could send me an email to mark at markbishopmedia.com. Love to hear from you. Any comments? Uh, I'm trying to find fascinating people and keep it light. You don't know heavy politics. We've got enough of that around us, haven't we? This is fun. And it was a pleasure. And I thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Goodbye.